Thank you very much, Dirk. I'm going to have to have you come and introduce me everywhere. That was uh, beyond generous, so I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, today, I, I want to talk about the relationship between law and finance. I believe that a lot of the journey that we're actually going on in this field uh, from a technological standpoint is to actually do better on this sort of topic where law intersects finance. And just to not to bury the lead, that's a kind of uh, term people sometimes use. I think in a lot of ways, law just is finance dressed up as something else. And so I want to explore that with you today. So in that frame, I want, if I'm, a, I'm only going to talk about one thing today, and that's arbitrage. Arbitrage is the spread between two markets, understanding that some insight in one area can help you in the other. So today in that frame, I think the insights from the history of finance can teach us something about how to do law better, particularly in the B2B context, although I, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about access to justice as well, which is because that's something of, I'm interested in as well. But this will be a more commercial talk uh, tonight. So if we're going to talk about arbitrage, I think we have to ask ourselves this. Why do we miss obvious opportunities? Every entrepreneur out there was able to see something that others couldn't. They were able to see an opportunity that was right there for the taking. Maybe circumstances conspired to make that the time. But you have to ask yourself, why do people all, always miss these obvious opportunities? You've ever seen somebody invent something, you think, I could have done that. That could have been me. But you didn't do it. Somebody else did. Why do you miss the obvious opportunities? Why do you miss those opportunities? They're right under your nose. They're there, they've been there the whole time. I think this law equals finance thing is obvious, totally obvious. But somehow we haven't been able to quite put the pieces together. OK, let's try to decompose the reasons. Number one. You are the hero of your own story. Everybody sort of sees this world where they construct the facts that they're the her heroic person rising against circumstances. And when you're the hero of your own story, you can't put your own thinking on trial. Now, you're lawyers or would-be lawyers. Putting things on trial is something that you should be getting pretty good at by now. But have you ever put your own thoughts on trial in the way that you should? Have you really examined why you think what you think? This is a challenge you face. Your thoughts betray you. That's it's what Lord Vader said. It's true for you. This is what you're existing in a little bubble, a little filter bubble, where you come to construct the world in a particular sort of way. And what I want you to do for the, for the balance of, this, of tonight and maybe going forward is to challenge those sorts of thoughts along this particular line, this vector that we're going to talk about tonight. The more successful you are, the more you become rigid. Lots of people become rigid because what happens is you do something, you have success, it feeds back, and it... And it sort of said, don't change anything. I'm doing well. Don't change anything. I'm doing well. Now, this is a paradoxical idea for a conversation at a law school. Most of the innovations in law didn't start in law. They came from somewhere else. So this is a paradox I'll put for you tonight. I think you need to develop a less law-centric view of the world. See, when law school, you get told that lawyers are the most important thing in the universe and that the whole world is constructed around you. And we have all these narratives, cultural narratives, about the importance of lawyers. Now, I'm not against lawyers. I'm not saying that they aren't important. But other people in other fields tell themselves that same story. If you can just step away from yourself for a moment and imagine you not in the universe, perhaps you could see that maybe there are other things that can inform your thinking, OK? So try to be a little less law-centric. That's how you're actually going to find these opportunities is if you don't think the way everybody else does, if you challenge your own thoughts. So my friend Paul Lippi, who uh, writes for the ABA Journal and was the general counsel of, of Synopsys, which is a large Silicon Valley company, says there's three types of lawyers out there. A mediocre lawyer plays whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole is like the kid's game, you know, where the thing pops up and they whack, they whack the kid thing down. A whack-a-mole lawyer goes around an organization creating fear and friction, all that saying, oh, this is risky. We can't do this. It's risk. Oh, there's, there's a lot of risks if we do this, if we do that. The business people in those organizations hate whack-a-mole lawyers. They do everything they can to not ever have any interaction with you. You're just a, a basically a, a nuisance that they have to deal with. A clever lawyer can help dis distort external perceptions of risk. Maybe you're able to convince people something is, isn't quite as it is. A great lawyer helps people price risk. It's not a very instructive statement to tell a business person that something is risky. 
business, business is inherently risk by its, own, by its very nature. So it's not a very, it's a, we would say, a content-free statement. It's like, how risky? Relative to what? Helping people pay the risk premium, just to use a finance way of talking about it, for the risk they're taking is the task that you're, that is your, that's your value proposition. People, what you're helping them do is not take an outsized risk relative to the risk premium they're paying for it. So to, to restate what your value proposition is, you should always ask yourself, why do people pay me money? What is actually that they're getting in exchange for the, for the services? Don't fall in love with the method of what you're doing. Understand what you're actually doing from a value perspective, not uh, this is the steps we follow to complete this task because somebody told me this is what I'm supposed to do because I went to law school and blah, blah, blah. Ask yourself what is the actual value you're providing. Think of it this way. If you're in a company and you have a legal department, what is the marginal value of the dollar I give you? What's it worth? Why don't I put the money into research and development if I'm in a company? And remember, all of the fancy law firms, they get all their money from the companies. It's not a charity they're running there. The people give them money for services rendered, and that money actually comes from companies, almost all of it. I'm talking, this again, an enterprise conversation. We could have a B2C conversation later, but I just, in a B2B. So you gotta ask this, why should I, why should I invest a dollar in legal over all the other things I could do? What's the value? That's the person who is actually paying for it, so you might as well ask that. So here's four different ways you might think about what a transactional lawyer does. Helps price the risk associated with a particular transaction and reduce information asymmetry. So if I'm gonna buy a company, I wanna understand, is this company what it really purports to be? So diligence is the task of trying to actually ascertain the answer to that, try to learn that. Litigation, predict or characterize the risk and exposure and try to uh, try to manage that risk and exposure relative to expectations. Compliance, it's almost certain that there's a, in a large organization, there's somebody engaging in rogue behavior, being able to find that. That's what a compliance arm does. Regulatory, work with regulators to try to make, to bring the organization in compliance with the relevant law. Manage that risk. So I'd like to focus every individual on the places where they actually provide a return on the invest dollar invested. The problem that we have in law is we, we talk about law as if it, it, it operates completely independent of markets. But there is a market all over the place, including a market in every company, and there's a market for legal services, and whether you're going to get the dollar or the euro or somebody else is going to get it, that's the open question. So today's analogy du jour, just to bring us back, is that law is finance and insurance as well. Now, it is not modern finance or modern insurance. It looks like finance from a different era. There's, we went on a long road from Black-Scholes to, to algorithmic trading. Black-Scholes is like one of the first options trading papers out there. Okay? Took many years to get there. It's an extension of a talk by my friend and colleague and frequent collaborator, Mike Bomarito. Here's what I mean by this is finance from a long gone era. It's, we, the dominant model of pricing and characterizing risk in law is single experts making decisions. We don't write insurance policies on the basis of one person's view about the risk, typically. We have an actual framework for doing that that's been developed over many years. But in law, people are doing the exact same thing. They're providing a forecast to a client based on their single mental model of what, what the actual activity that's going on. It's, not a very, it's a very non-rigorous way to run, run your affairs. So I want to encourage you, again, putting your thoughts on trial, how do we get past that to something better? What that leads to from the client side is a lot of unintentional self-insurance. So the decision you're about to help them render, they're actually writing themselves a personal insurance policy based on your representations. You might not think about it that way, but you're having them take the risk, ergo they're running an insur their own insurance company, and you just became the underwriter. Of course, you're not the real underwriter because you're not going to pay them back when you make a mistake, are you? It's, the, it's a good model if you're in it better model is to actually fix the underlying pro process. This is the process today. The cult of a single person's decision making, typically single, often not much more than that, is driving these decisions with massive financial consequences. Now, this was said, so it might as well be said again. This is the other issue. There's a borderline pathological sort of numeric, numerophobia that goes on. Like what we say, you know, if you, people were good at math, they would be engineers. If they were, didn't, or if they didn't like blood, they're here. Those are the kind of the two reasons. If you like blood, you'd be a doctor, and if you were better at math, you'd be an engineer. 
Now, maybe you're different, but I just want to flag that as a general tendency that you see in every law school in the world is basically we oversample on this, okay? Now, today's claim is that fintech, financial technology, that's the technology arm that's trying to disrupt the financial services industry, has many lessons to offer in law. Now, there's the masters of the universe. If they can be disrupted and be touched by this, it's not so much to think they're a lot fancier and smarter than the, law, the lawyers are by a long shot, Goldman is. So I just want to put this out to you. This is a conversation that's going on in finance right now about how, what, it, what, what is happening in that space. And so it looks a lot to me like the conversation we're in. So I think that big, one of the big vectors over the coming decade is to actually try to financialize a lot of the processes that people do in law. This is a very Baroque sort of exercise that people have. And it's a very not well-specified risk mitigation that's going on here. So just by way of uh, introduction, there are two big branches in FinTech, two big branches. One, people look at some financial process and say, why, do we, why, is the, why are those the steps we follow? Why do we do it in that order? Could we re-engineer that process in some way? And the goal is to remove what might be called socially meaningless frictions. Some frictions are socially meaningful, note. Some are not. Some are just, typically if you hear somebody say, the, w the reason we did that is because that's the way we do things, that means they have no independent justification for what they're doing. They're just asserting that it ought to be done this way without an actual justification. Those are places you might, you might be looking for as opportunities. The other branch of FinTech is characterizing and pricing previously thought to be exotic forms of risk. So there's a bunch of companies that say, you know, people think you can't predict X, but I think we can. Let's write a policy, an insurance policy, or let's, let's trade that asset in a financial market somewhere. And that's a big part of the fintech space. So I think that there's the intersection of legal technology and financial technology. There's a bunch of use cases or applications that I'd like to talk a little bit about. So this idea of fin legal tech is the blend or the intersect of those two spheres. Now, just I will note that we organized a conversation around this. I think the first conference of its type at my school. Um, we have the videos that will be slowly being made available over the, the course of the, the, this year. So if you're interested in more, there will be a bunch of videos available online at the lawlabchannel.com, lawlabchannel.com. This is just a little bit of, uh, from that conference. So Finn Legal Tech. I want to start just briefly make mention of this removing socially meaningless friction. Across the entire economy, there's this effort to do the industrialization of an artisan process. So, so, so an artisan is going to paint you a beautiful painting, but people try to put industrial methods on top of that particular artisan process. And so that's a big, that's a big dominant theme in business. Okay? This is sort of what Richard is talking about in his book, The End of Lawyers, is this process of moving from bespoke to commoditized across a spectrum. So a bespoke suit, of course, is like a handcrafted, hand-tailored, highly expensive, highly one-off, not scalable. Can we get to something that's a little more rigor rigorous and a little bit more systematized and then productized and commoditized? So I want to focus on this step, because that's where a lot of things are right now, is we're getting some things out of the bespoke column, and we're trying to move them more into the standardized and systematized level. Um, this is a, pi a picture that uh, my friend uh, Kim Craig, who I teach a class with in process improvement at, at my law school, which I'll talk about in a second. This is her portrait of a hypothetical legal process, as we think it is, as it actually is, and as it should be. Now, one of the rules in process improvement is every step that does not add value to the end user or client is waste. Law is full of waste. Socially meaningless frictions. Put them on trial. Don't do them. If they don't add value and they're not absolutely mandated, then don't do them. Now, that's easier said than done in a large, complex, distributed organization with lots of people. That's what makes it hard. If it's just you personally doing some task, but you're going to work in groups and teams with lots of people, and this is why it gets complicated to actually manage these processes. I met recently with the general counsel of a large publicly traded company who employed these process improvement methods in their organization, and he told me I had to do it, actually. I had to because the organization itself ran on these principles, their manufacturing company. But look, I would not even be the general counsel of the company if I hadn't done this. I would, they just would have gotten rid of me and gotten somebody else. 
what he told me is, I've reduced the legal expenditures over the last like uh, 10 years by 50%. Because a lot of it was socially meaningless friction. He didn't use that phrase, but he just said it was, it was a lot of waste. And we, I moved some of the work inside. I just leaned out the process, and we just were able to get rid of a lot of costs. That really, I think, we, I think we do just about as good a work as we did before. We just were spending way too much money to do the task at hand. So, I mean, sometimes people say, this field mass needs a productivity initiative badly. We're basically just about as productive as we were 25 years ago. Almost every other field is way more productive than they were 25 years ago, except for this one. So Lean Six Sigma, Lean and or Six Sigma are two well-known process improvement methods. Lean comes out of Toyota, and it's the Toyota manufacturing system, and Six Sigma comes out of General Electric and Motorola. Um, there are some differences between them, but they're both sort of ways to think about industrialization. And I think every subsector, whether it's B2B or B2C and everything in between, can, and, and government, by the way, can be made better by employing these, these processes. And just, just on background, this starts in the industrial field in, and has moved into white collar work. Most notably, it's been moved into places like hospitals, um, into accounting, and to other white collar fields, and some to some extent in law. One other book I'll point you to is this book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is a massive bestseller. And it's about employing checklists, not because people don't know the steps, because they make fewer mistakes. It was written by a guy who's a surgeon. He said, when, I f when we follow the checklist, we make fewer errors. I know how to do surgery. You get in the moment, things are quick, you're going through things, and I, you can make mistakes that you never would think you would make when you have lots of work to do. My, my father-in-law is an airline pilot. They fly on the checklist, flew in the US Air Force, and then flies commercially. You follow the checklist, you make fewer mistakes. The air, number of airline deaths has dropped precipitously over the last two decades. A lot more people flying than ever before, and a lot less people dying per flight by a long shot, just because of something simple like this. So in law, there's examples, Saifar Shah being the most notable one. They're a, um, one of the 100 largest law firms in the, in the United States. So they've been, they've been doing a lot of work in this area. Here's the sample map. These maps are in people's minds. L lawyers are actually are process driven. The problem is the process is in your mind. You can't distribute that to others. So when you're like training a young lawyer, you to say, look, if you have a question, look at the map. Start with the map. And it's a way to allow people to learn without having to have the stigma of asking the question. But also, if you're the senior person, you don't have to answer all these easy questions. And they can just look at the map. So it, it, has, it serves a lot of functions in an organization. This is just an example of one of these processes. It goes on for page, page after page. But this is a sample piece of litigation. But you could, they do it for M&A and a million other things. They have 500 of these process maps. This is an article from last month. They're about profitability. Again, I, I mean, we're talking about commercial law. This is not a charity, as I said earlier. This is a business. Ergo, if you can use business methods to do it better, all to, all to, the, all to the good. A lot of writing about this. So I think this is a recent article um, in this a magazine that Harvard puts out called The Practice about some of these ideas. Okay. So the goal is to try to remove waste and increase predictability. This is what a lot of legal processes look like. Way too much work to do, not enough work to do. Way too much work to do, not enough work to do. Way too much work to do, not enough work to do. The problem with the, the volleys is you ain't, if you can't fill something to stick into that time, that's a lot of lost productivity or opportunity to do things. Then you can only work so many hours at the upper dilemma. What you would like is a process that looks like this. Now, you can't quite achieve that because you don't control all the elements of the process. But you'd be surprised how much better you can get these, these processes to look. This is why a lot of people quit law, too, because they don't want to work 18 hours. And then sit around and think, where am I going to get my next thing to do? And then go in this boom and bust cycle all the time. That's what a disciplined operation looks like. You can't quite hit that. This isn't actual manufacturing. But we can get a lot closer, and a lot of organizations are doing a lot better on that front. Okay. This is what, this is, you can do these process mapping exercises. You map the whole process and you remove and re-engineer and take away anything that doesn't add value. So that's knowledge management together with Lean. And this is a class that we teach um, at Chicago Ken on this topic with Cyfarth. Okay, now let's go back over. That was the process side of the house. So I, the key lesson for you is that there are, there are no well-known methods 
that can be deployed in this space to do this stuff better. Law can be better. It does not have to be the way it is. It can be made better. These are the ways to do it. So Fin Legal Tech. FinTech has actually followed the path of artificial intelligence. There's been more applied AI research in finance than anywhere else that I can think of other than maybe search technology, i.e. Google. And so there's been a lot of interest in applying AI to law. Like practically every week, there's a robot lawyers article in some publication in the world. This is a small, a not small subset of the number of robot lawyer articles. This might be peak robot lawyer, but who knows? It's not clear. Yeah, they just keep coming. They can't, they're just, literally this is, I could push down for like the next 10 minutes and we would just roll through them. Now I believe, as I said here, that the real roll up of all this isn't robot lawyers, but it's financialization. Part of it is if you can predict something, if you, if you have ability to forecast some activity, why are you worried about making a lawyer 2% more efficient? You're actually solving for a core reason why the lawyer is there in the first place that prediction function. I'll talk more about that in a second. But I want to make sure you know a little bit about the orientation of the two types of AI that are out there. People are calling everything, that all this stuff AI, and it is a, of sorts, but I want you to understand there's two sort of big methodological camps that about how people go through this. So there's so what's called data-driven AI and rules-based AI. When you, sometimes this is called computational law. If you hear data-driven AI, think prediction. If you think rules-based AI, think expert system. Now, I, I'll just put my cards on the table. I'm extremely bearish on expert systems. And the reason I'm bearish on them is they haven't really worked too well in virtually every place they've been deployed. I'm not against them on first principles. I'm against them because they haven't been shown to be terribly successful. But more on that in a second. But I just want to give you at least the, uh, three examples of places people have at least successfully deployed them. I'm not against them. If you can give me an example where they work well, I'm all for it. So here's three examples. Example one, tax preparation software. This is a public, this is a B2C product that's sold. Basically, people answer a set of questions, which is bus just a bunch of if else's. If this, then this, if this, then this, if uh, this, then else this, uh, uh, dot, dot, dot. And what happens is they're actually answering the questions they need to order to fill in their tax forms. So this is a commercial product that is very popular in the United States. They've sold, I think they have 30 million users in the US. So that's a very good business, very profitable. This is a product that, uh, uh, that we've developed at, at my law school called A to J Author, which is a justice, uh, access to justice product, which allows um, a legal aid organization to take some process and instead of saying fill out a form, just say to the person, answer a set of questions and walk on this roadmap and people What's happening in the background as they answer the questions is the documents are getting completed. And it's just a bunch of ifs and thens. Decision tree in the background. And so we've had three and a half million users of the platform. So it's been a fairly successful thing. I'd like to get to more. Third example is this commercial company called Neota Logic. What they do is build, allow you to basically build your own what decision trees, rules based this and the idea is that the exp an expert has in their mind a set of rules. If you were going to interview a client, you're actually trying to extract information that allows you to figure out the, the different um, elements that might matter about their case. And, and the question is, can you plug it into a tree like this? So the most, one of the very successful places it's been used is actually for non-lawyers, like people in human resources, for example, who make decisions that have legal consequences. And so this is a place but other places like, is this a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violation? Is this, is, is this a data breach? And if so, what are the steps I'm supposed to follow? At, long before it ever got to anybody in the legal department or some outside lawyer, somebody in the organization has to make that, that, what it turns out to be a legal characterization of what went on to even know to send it to somebody. This is all going to become chatbots. This will all roll right up into chatbots. That's where this goes. So. That, uh, that is actually potentially the r renaissance of expert systems. But no notice what's going on. It's data now that's going to make it. So it's those two-way interactions at scale that allow you to get past this mining the human expert one-off, no, non-scalable kind of into it, you know, their view of how, how the process works. You're actually able to watch people inter interact and scale that. So we see a lot of AI in the legal industry, a lot of robot lawyers. That's really consistent with AI in general. There's lots of issues with expert systems. I just want to get that out there. So I think folks 
more often move to data centered approaches, and that's what I want to do over the balance of my uh, presentation to you today. Um, so these, are, this is really what AI state of the art is. There's a lot of people talking about robot lawyers. If they're talking about expert systems, um, I'm generally out with extreme prejudice on that. Unless it's a, a chatbot, then I might consider it. Otherwise, purely data centric offerings augment expert forecasts with data or iterative rules and data. And the iterative rules and data is like chatbots. That would be, that's a modern version. But the kind of traditional expert system, no. Again, that hasn't generally worked. So if you go back to FinTech, there have been huge advances made in the science of prediction, predicting things, which is a big part of what finance is about, forecasting, prediction, so forth and so on. So in Fin Legal Tech, we're starting to have the application of predictive analytics. Now, some jurisdictions are further ahead than others, but in every place, a lawyer is out there providing advice about what is going to happen in a particular context. And so one thing I would encourage you to do is don't think about the classic lawyer move of how this doesn't apply to your area. I hear that everywhere I go, everywhere around the world. Oh, but this, my area is different, Dan. Try to, like, don't do that. Just say, instead, what, maybe there is something here. Maybe there's, I'm not looking at it right. Let me try to see if I can find a link between some of the things I'm interested in and some of these ideas. Nothing you're trying to predict is harder than like the task in reinsurance, for example. That is like super unclear what they're forecasting. You know, what's the likelihood of something happening over the next 50 years of some particular task? Way harder problem than anything or most of the things people are doing here. So just try to understand that people have tried way harder problems than most of the things we would pose here and have been able to carry off some version of something that, that worked for the people. So here's some public examples, lots of proprietary examples. Here's four of them. Predicting securities fraud class action lawsuits using an algorithm, predicting tax outcomes, predicting patent outcomes, predicting judicial decisions in the uh, European Court of Human Rights. These are four papers that try to do one form or another prediction. So four use cases, okay? Here's just a more generally a set of prediction tasks we're trying to accomplish in law. Predicting relevant documents, that's diligence and discovery or e-disclosure. Predicting contract terms and understanding how they map the out to outcomes. So people are like changing contracts around under the view that they're lowering the risk to their client. Is that true? Have they actually lowered the risk? How does one clause trade off against another clause? Predicting rogue behavior, predicting case outcomes, predicting regulatory outcomes. All of these are things that clients ask people to do all the time, lawyers to do all the time. Tell me what's going to happen. What if we do this strategy versus this strategy? What if we write it this way versus that way? This is all the things people are thinking about in their head. So I want to go back into finance, pretend for a minute we were trading. Say we were trading securities. There's three known ways in all of human history to predict something. Experts, crowds, and algorithms. This is the only three ways that have ever been developed in all of humanity to actually forecast something. This is it. This is the whole menu. It's what we got. Here's an example from our own work. Don't worry about the example too much. All of those like papers I showed you from different places are deploying some variant of what I'm going to show you. So I'm going to talk about you know, the jurisdiction I'm in, but you can take these general ideas to other places. So I'm going to talk about US Supreme Court decisions, predicting them. Same methods can be applied to predict transactional risk, regulatory risk, litigation risk, so forth and so on. OK, experts. 13 years ago, there was a tournament run between a very simple algorithm, very simple, like pretty straightforward, it's been around for a while, and it was put up against a set of experts, human experts. This list is like a who's who of the US Legal Academy and members of the Supreme Court bar. Those are the people who actually argue like Supreme Court cases. And the hiss was the task. Predict the upcoming Supreme Court term in advance. It's not much of a trick to predict the future knowing the future. That's called cheating. Okay. So they had to predict the cases in advance, and then they kept score. One of the problems we have in law is we really don't keep score. And when you keep score, typically you find out things aren't as good as, as, as advertised. So this is one term. Maybe you can't extrapolate from one term, but this is at least one time we kept score. They got 58% of the cases right. You might say, well, Dan, is that good or is that bad? It's not great because they reverse about just over 60% of the cases they hear. So in other words, if you knew nothing and you guessed, on average, you could do about as well as they did, knowing nothing about the content of the, of the law, literally nothing, just a simple rule. If they took it, guess reverse, how would you do? This is called in statistics overfitting. 
sometimes called fitting to the signal, or fitting to the noise and not the signal. My friend Ed Walters calls this the tyranny of the hunches. But if keeping on the theme of finance, if this was finance, this is a, of somebody who cannot make more money than the simple idea of just buy the S&P or buy the FTSE or buy some index fund. Index funds are incredibly cheap. All they do is match some index of stocks, which diversify your holdings. And here's some free, simple financial advice. Buy an index and look up in 35 years, OK? Because two thirds of fund managers can't do better than that. They pay them money. You actually pay them money to manage your money and not be a very simple thing that is practically free. Warren Buffett got into an argument with a bunch of these hedge fund guys. And he said, I don't think what you do is really all that great. I think I can beat you with the S&P. And so he got into a bet with them. And, he, and it was over 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, he was going to buy the S&P, and they would do whatever they wanted to, and they would compare returns. Again, keep score, and you find out who really does something. So here's the deal. Unless the US stock market, the S&P goes down by 44% this year, which would be pretty catastrophic, they're gonna, he's going to win the bet. Hedge funds, fancy, fancy stuff, but it doesn't actually offer the returns that people think it does. Now, some hedge funds do. Two-thirds of fund managers don't beat the S&P, but some do. Every person thinks they're in the one-third. It's like the hero of the story thing. Everybody thinks they're in the one-third, but one-third are in the one-third, right? I know you didn't go to law school to do math, but we can do fractions, right? We're good with that. One-third, is that's like this much, and then that's two-thirds. OK. I was trying to show it to you visually. OK, yeah. In, in finance, this is called it being a noise predictor. Noise predictors can't beat the market. They think they have a system. They think they're providing all this value. But when you compare them to a basic thing, they just can't beat the market. Law is full of noise predictors. Claim. What we need to do is actually evaluate and benchmark people's performance over time, like a rigorous field would. This is not a rigorous field. Let's just say it as straight as, as I can. A rigorous field keeps score. A non-rigorous field fills in the void with uh, reputation and social capital and a bunch of stuff that I could care less about. I want to know how well you actually do at the task, which I think is a, fair, a, much, more, a much fairer way to run things than, we're, oh, well, you're friends with so-and-so, and oh, you went to this school versus that school. I want to actually see performance. So I'll tell you who the best forecaster of US Supreme Court decisions is. The best known guy is this guy here. His name is Jacob Berloff. He lives in a one bedroom apartment in Queens, New York. And he's not a lawyer. That guy has beaten thousands of other people in a national tournament that we run, which I'll talk about in a second. He's actually what's called, known to be called a super forecaster. The US Defense Department has been interested in finding what's called a non-traditional predictor. What they mean is a person who maybe didn't even graduate high school or college, but happens to be good at predicting, in their case, geopolitical events. They're a very type of, certain type of pedigree gets you to work at, say, Langley, Virginia. Very particular type of pedigree. You went to this school, you, you, you were in this social group, and so forth and so on. But that's how you get groupthink. Everybody sort of has the same experiences, sees the world in the same way, and you make mistakes collectively. So they wanted to find a way to find people who don't look like that and don't have those views, but are good at the task at hand. So they ran these public tournaments to actually keep, keep score and find these people who are non-traditional predictors. Jacob is our version of that. Jacob is a super forecaster. So I mentioned crowds in this example. It's called Fantasy SCOTUS. It's, uh, it's as cool as it sounds. Uh, but what it is is a tournament where people predict. Thousands of people get together, and they predict the cases, and we keep score. It's been written up in a lot of places. But this is our team. And for every decision, uh, every upcoming decision of the court, I have a crowd-based forecast of, the, of what the crowd thinks. Now, here's the spoiler alert. The crowd is terrible at predicting things. It's just like the market. Collectively, they're lousy. They can't beat the guess, guess reverse. But there is a subset of people. Not every member of that crowd is made equal. 
we maintain a super crowd kind of in that super forecasty sort of idea that's the top predictors up to the most recent time period. That super, this is one of the important insights. That super crowd outperforms even this best single player. You ever heard the phrase, the smartest person in the room is the room? So we get a room full of really smart lawyers and then we let one person make the decision. That's again, it's a false construct. It's been, they've gotten rid of it in lots of other fields because they know it to be wrong, but yet we do it all the time over here. By the way, last term, that's how the super crowd did, 84%, the top players, as a Condorcet jury, just to be technical for a moment. Now, my view is there's not nearly enough crowd decision in based in our institutions. Lots of institutions in society still need to do more of this. Now, who cares what I have to say? This is an article in Harvard Business Review. Lead author is Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and here's what he says. You don't understand how expensive, inconsistent decision-making is in your organizations. Doesn't show up in a balance sheet anywhere, but it's the source of tremendous risk. Now, remember, we're supposed to be the people managing risk. Note. So he goes through a bunch of examples across different fields of human endeavor. Most notably, I'll point out medicine and software development where the parties involved cannot forecast to a reasonable level of accuracy consistently over time. We built a commercial offering called Lexomble, which is a platform that allows people to do crowdsourcing in their organizations. Or what would be called an insurance, they call this sometimes manual underwriting. Manual underwriting means if you don't have a statistical model, at least leverage the wisdom of the crowd, the collective group of decision makers. Okay. So brief, brief aside about crowd-based prediction, we posed a task to the crowd um, and said, who, who's going to be the next Supreme Court justice in the United States? Twelve days after Donald Trump was elected president, they said Neil Gorsuch will be the, will be the nominee. Now, that was before I looked around. I said, Gorsuch, he's not on any of the lists. I looked on all these articles. There was no mention of him in the media for, for weeks, if not a, a month or two. My crowd had it straight away, 12 days after the election. So it was written up in a bunch of places. Okay, algorithms. Remember, it's experts, crowds, and algorithms. We have this paper that was recently released and put on in PLOS One, which is a science journal, uh, a public library of science. Um, this was just this was a write-up that was in Science um, a couple days ago uh, about this idea. So it's a, I'm going to explain a little bit about the model. It's a, it's a statistical model called a random forest, which actually relies on crowdsourcing. So what you do is you build a bunch of statistical models and intentionally change the amount of information and the amount of variables and the amount of observations that you give to them. So that's like intentionally biasing people and then aggregating that bias view together for a collective, collectively making the group wise. So imagine Overfitting happens because you anchor to like one data point more than you should. So what if I take this whole group and I intentionally rewire the set of information I give you? Collectively, you'll make a better decision than if I present one version of the information to all of you. That's the kind of, that's the construct people have used. It's a very popular algorithm that's out there. Um, if you want a taste of how it works, we have a set of free online teaching materials, quantitative methods for lawyers uh, online. So this is like a, like a, just a set of course teaching materials. You can teach yourself this stuff. Um, I'm still building out this second class. We have about half of it done. I'm going to finish it this summer called Legal Analytics Course. And this is a machine learning course for lawyers, including teaching you what a random forest is and how it works. OK, so experts, crowds, and algorithms. If you didn't see where this was going to go, let me just put it together. An ensemble, which means a blend or a crowd of, of or a blend of uh, streams of intelligence, typically outperforms any single stream. Or this is actually a statement about the entire economy. Humans plus machines are better than humans or machines for a wide range of tasks. Any non, almost virtually any non-trivial task this is true of. Virtually any non-trivial task. It doesn't mean it's easy to put it together. It doesn't, it's not trivial to, to actually put that together. Here's a visual dis, dis depiction of what I'm talking about. I've got these individual streams of intelligence. The next thing to do is to try to blend them. Maybe this is the blend, maybe something else is the blend. That itself is a learning problem, a machine learning problem, to actually to specify it. So this is my point to you, though. What we're trying to do across lots of problems in law is figure out how to create those streams of intelligence and, and figure out how to aggregate or roll them up. 
to make better decisions. By the way, just as a quick note, if, if you, just to keep on the finance theme, if you can predict these decisions and these decisions affect publicly traded securities, then could you trade on the cases? Yes, answer. The court makes a decision which affects this company and it's traded on a stock market somewhere and when it's decided, the company's worth more money or less money as a function of the decision. So that's what we evaluate here. An obvious trading opportunity. But I would say a lot of these decisions actually, litigation decisions, even though they don't affect the publicly traded security, they are on a balance sheet somewhere and should be thought of as an asset under management. That's a term of art, an asset under management. We actually have a, a growing litiga global litigation finance industry, and here's the basic construct. They has all the properties that you see in the rest of finance. In here's the institutional capital players, just some of them. Here's the funding platforms, like LendingTree is one, Lending Club, whatever. This would be like a fintech company. There's just a bunch of these types of ideas. And this is, to me, even is a bridge too far, but I just might make note of it, which is buying shares in lawsuits. So, so that's a Wild West air idea, okay. But if you think about it from an asset va valuation standpoint, lots of other litigation decisions are actually implicit litigation finance. If you choose not to settle the case, then you're running, you are essentially running your own litigation funding operation as a company or as a person. Or if you choose to pursue the case and not take the settlement if you're the plaintiff, then you're funding, your own, you're doing the same thing. And here, this is actually the company's requirement to, bar to mark these things, often not done in a particularly rigorous manner, but just make note, this is actually a place where they're supposed to hold money out under the accounting standards for a, a set of liabilities that they may face downstream under the ga uh, GAAP standards. But this isn't the only place where we see law as finance. Here's another one. Do I charge you by the hour or do I charge you in some other manner associated with the value? Well, that itself is a finance and insurance question also. And here's the insurance proposition. Who bears the cost if we go over? So if you go to build a building, people will bid often an amount, a set amount of money, and if they do it for less, they make money, and if they do it for more, you, they have to, if it costs them more money, then they have to eat the difference. Now, that requires you to be able to predict things. So the, the problem is we don't, we're not good at forecasting these things. Like, people always ask, how much is this going to cost? We'll say, well, every case is different. But I thought you're an expert about this area. Yeah, but every case is different. You see the dissidence in that, the cognitive dissonance? You're supposed to know everything about it, yet you can't tell me basic numbers like what it would cost to do it. From a corporate counsel perspective, the, here's the pricing goal. You don't need to predict the cost of this particular matter. You need to be able to manage your portfolio of matters to a number. Yeah, you, like you forecast one thing, it goes high. You for, forecast one thing, it goes low. You just got to do good on the portfolio. The S&P 500 is a 500 company. Some go up, some go down. What does the total portfolio do? So again, another finance construct is a way to think about how to manage that. It's a portfolio of stuff. That's how you would run a more rigorous version of self-insurance. Now, this is a, a new development is that uh, AIG has a legal ops service that they're trying to sell to other companies. I, I have no particular insight, but it, it sort of strikes me. I think, well, why, why, why are they selling legal operations services to other companies? That doesn't really make a tremendous amount of sense. Don't they sell insurance? Not their business, insurance? It's well, I think what happens is you do ops so that you can learn enough to maybe downstream start selling legal cost insurance and other forms of exotic insurance offerings because the play is to get the data so that you can learn the information you need to know so that you can price the risks associated with a bunch of these tasks. By the way, for law firms, this would be horrible. This would be that the person that you have to actually get your money from isn't the actual client but the insurer for who, whom, yeah. Generally, people dealing with insurance companies don't like, love that experience always. Transactional work as Finn Legal Tech. So we talked about the price of lawyers. Now let's talk about transactional value. Here's Bob. Say hi to Bob, everyone. Bob's a lawyer on a major corporate transaction. He also has a bow tie. Bob is about to engage in a, another markup of deal terms. Another round of markup. This is about to gonna create another delay in the expected close of the deal. Here's the economics question. How much value is created by those modifications 
versus how much delay will be introduced and what's the cost of that delay. This is called, quote, over-lawyering the transaction. The business people are like, why is it taking forever? How much value did you actually create? Well, no, these are necessary. Necessary in what construct? How much money did you generate by what you just did? All I know is you're taking us time. You need to be able to characterize what you've just done. This is what the business people, if you haven't had this experience, you will. Um, we need to better understand the actual drivers of risk. We're spending time putting an effort under risks that we are not able to be very well specify. What does it mean, what is the change in risk if I change my paper to your paper, your term to my term, so forth and so on? This is what people negotiate out over time. Oh, I want this version of this clause, I want you to have this, and there's all this trading going on what the, what the form of the, of the clause ought to be. Now, I will note that the, we see these little pockets where people figure out law is finance and let's treat it as such. People realized what I could do is stop the lawyers from doing any more work. And I could solve the underlying problem, which is I don't really, I can keep going on and writing reps and warranties on, on an M&A deal, or eventually you just say, look, how about we just use insurance to end this, end this thing and get it done? In other words, I can spend more time learning more about you before I acquire you as a company, and maybe I'll find out there's new risk and maybe I won't, or maybe we can just let somebody put all that risk of there being some unknown problem with the company and just put it in a, a big bucket and sell a policy over it, a tranche. So this used to be like a couple of companies. Now it's a lot of companies that are in this space selling an insurance product in M&A. Now, outside of M&A, I think you've got to have a better idea of deal terms and substantive outcomes. And the way this can manifest is very simple. Very simple. We'll accept your paper on this, but I need another 1.7% on the deal. Well, now you've gotten a premium from them by accepting some risk of the difference between your paper and their paper. But why 1.7%? Why not 2.7% or 0.7%? If you can't map the, the change in risk, then you don't have a way to actually... What we do now is we sort of just pit the ball back and forth, and then they, I'll trade you this clause for this clause, I'll trade you this thing for this thing. So you get some mixture of the two, but you typically, people have difficulty getting... Sometimes people are able to negotiate more money on the deal, but often it's just this back and forth that leads to some mixture of the two agreements, some Frankenstein of the two agreements. Okay. Now, how do you distribute that to lots of people? Lots of salespeople are going around selling and getting contracts signed, and how would you be able to distribute and pre-authorize people to take the other side's paper if it has these properties, so forth and so on? Again, that's, that's a big problem that's mostly not been solved. A couple other additional lessons for fintech versus legal tech. Fintech is a place where people have spent more time than any, almost anywhere I can think of, other than maybe search, working with unstructured data. 80% of the world's data is unstructured. Fintech has had to confront this. People in Fintech try to trade securities, it's one of the things they do, or manage risk by pulling lots of data streams together to look for not well understood risks and characterize those. But it's all this unstructured data, like I gotta put this piece together, this, and oh wow, there's this risk that I didn't realize, or this company's not worth what I think it is, or it's worth way more than people think it is, whatever the direction is. Now you can let humans do that tech, that data collection and augmentation, or you can use technology. Humans are actually pretty good pattern detectors, but only for certain types of problems. Here's 60 seconds of high frequency trading. By the time you figure out the pattern, the arbitrage will be gone. By the time you figure out that pattern, it's too late. That's not a problem we can put humans on. So I want to point you to two examples of anomaly detection. I'll just mention a third one is credit card, credit card fraud detection is an anomaly detection. You get your card shut off because somebody did in a transaction which was out of pattern for you. That's, a, that's an algorithmic identification in near real time of anomalous behavior. Okay? But let me give you two examples from law. One is called the discovery compliance convergence. After something's gone wrong, people say to themselves, gee, this is the same set of stuff we should have been looking for all along in real time. Now, some things are complete one-offs. That It's something that we've never seen before, and we don't know what to do with it. But other things are just the same problem that we've seen many times that cause a problem, like trader blows a hole in the bank. Heard that song and dance before more than once. Somebody bribes a foreign official. Something goes wrong on a car, 
and one part of the organization isn't connected with the other, and sorry to do this, but there's this one too. Now that one might be a little bit more of a one-off, I'll acknowledge that. That may have been a little bit more exotic, but whatever. That's a really hard problem for us. That is the hardest data problem in all of law, as I see it. It's the only one that's actually so-called big data. This is find this, these behaviors in an organization and flag it in real time, as close to real time as possible. Because we want to figure out, hey, I think this person's stealing money. I think this person's bribing somebody. I think this person, I think this information about in this report should have gone, uh, that this engineering report needed to go to somebody because we got a problem with a car. I think this trader is taking way too much risk and is, is trying to see if he can hit his bonus, but if he doesn't, he's going to put a hole in the bank. The goal is to try to get some type of monitoring regime and all these compliance tasks that lots of compliance professionals are working on, this is, this is what they're after. Now, you have a data uh, uh, privacy regime, okay? So this is all subject to the limits of the law. But after the fact, this is all what the investigation is always about. Try to figure out what that person was doing and how, how it could have been monitored better and so forth and so on. So this is kind of a 1.0 version. This is like keyword searching for certain types of phrases, like backdating options and defect and airbag. The second version of this is to actually monitor people communications or understand when they're, I mean, they, we already do this in certain ways, like people uh, who are executives of companies cannot sell more securities than a certain al allocated amount. So we kind of have versions of this out there. We have controls in place because, you know, that would be insider trading, like if they were new information and sold the company stock before the Republic knew, something like this. Second example, we all have a tell. You ever seen those guys playing poker? They're like trying to cover their face. They're like, because they're wearing their sunglasses and the whole bit. Because it's not just your thoughts that betray you, your face betrays you. A tell is this idea that you have a little tick or fi facial thing or your face show shows what your cards are. There's a lot of efforts in trading to trade on what's called sentiment, which is that the way you write words actually reveals something about some, some action in the world. This is where people, tr this is one of the places people try to trade on securities filings. The idea is based on the way they wrote this 8K or 10K, it reveals that maybe this company is going to restate profits. Maybe this problem is worse than advertised, so forth and so on. We've done a little bit of work on this, more on this to come in later this year. But sentiment analysis is a big field of computer science, and, and there's a bunch of different toolkits out there to work on this task. But I just want to flag this is this is already something people are seeing. So people who write 10Ks spend time the smart ones, thinking about exactly what a trader would do with this, and is it revealing information we don't want to reveal? This is, uh, uh, you know, Harry Potter? There's the defense against the dark arts teacher. Remember that? You need a defense against this dark art here. Even if you're not going to do this, people can do this to you, which means I think the way you're representing the language in here tells me that you think your case is bad or you think your position is poor or something or not. I think this is a source of new source of competitive legal intelligence is legal sentiment analysis. Okay. So the final thing I want to I want to talk about is is combating complexity, which I think is really one of the underlying challenges for for all of law. We, the problems that we've been forced to work on are problems of a of enormous complexity. And if you look at the places by the way that the Law firms have had the largest economic returns. It's working on these problems of enormous complexity. We have a serious problem with information management and legal. It's just what we've done to solve this currently, it's just thrown more and more people at it. So we had this boom time in law. We just put more and more humans on the problem. But the complexity of these problems kept scaling. M&A, the complexity goes up and up and up. All this regulatory compliance work, more complexity, more complexity. It's not. The law is more complex, but it's also the, the organizations are more complex. If we do a deal, it's not here. It's in, it's in 180 places in the world. It's just unimaginable complexity from where we were, say, 35 years ago in law. Now, on the operations side, people don't collect information that could regulari be regularized and used to inform operations. And the information necessary to do things like this, reg various types of diligence or regulatory exercises, is in some antiquated format, like a TIFF file or a PDF or word. Horrible. Horrible. This is the problem. This is really the big challenge for, will be the big challenge if you do transactional work of your career. 
legal work product is not a pointable data object. This is what contracts are, and this is what contracts want to become. And actually already have become where? Financial services, that's always the answer in this particular lecture. Derivatives are traded on the basis of computable contracts. Virtually nothing else is. We write contracts in natural language today to represent a set of contingent states about the universe, but there's other ways to do those representations. Code is one way to represent some of those ideas. I think fixing this problem in an organization is the source of immediate value creation. So what legal work products should do is pull, push data out and pull data in. Push data out, pull data in. You and I agree that we will update prices based on inflation over time. You can manually update a spreadsheet or an accounting system, or you can have pull data from some data feed about in inflation, calculate within the contract, compute it, push it out to an accounting system and say, pay him X amount for Y goods delivered. This is what contracts can be and are becoming. Sensor data and contracts talking to other contracts, contracts talking to other systems, which is actually our example of the Internet of Things. That's what the Internet of Things is. You have a sensor, you have an object that pulls and pushes information. It's not science fiction. It's real. Here's the first company has the first version of that. Again, obvious, obvious idea. Totally obvious. If you're paying attention to the world. This is just watch the world, figure out what it means in law, and execute. This is a very straight, and it solves for a real problem. That's a lot of friction that, and cost that goes on with managing these contracts and updating these systems. So we're in this long process of overhauling the global financial infrastructure. It's a huge friction reduction exercise. Big four or big law, who's I'm going to go with the big four because they, they build products, and lawyers generally historically don't build products. Only time will tell. This is the other piece of, of what you need to make that really hum is the blockchain. Because that becomes the authentication layer that allows that Internet of Contracts idea to be carried off. I have a data feed on the blockchain which says what the inflation rate is. It's pushed into a secure system. My ledger is read by your system. I can pay, I can internally have a blockchain and I can have an exposed one to another party. This is part of the infrastructure, but the other part is to translate our, our object which is the contract into this kind of construct here. So lots of coverage of this idea. Again, most of the interest has been in finance first because the, cost of, the benefits of getting it right are astronomical. So summary, Bitcoin isn't probably that important, but the blockchain is important. I don't, I, I'm kind of pretty, I think Bitcoin's stupid, but blockchain is, isn't. But uh, maybe old man should me, I don't know. But okay, so some concluding thoughts. In some, I believe that we're going to be able to financialize, financialize large parts of the legal industry. And by which I mean apply the basic tools of finance insurance to predict and better understand a wide range of procedural and substantive outcomes, which I think will actually better establish the value proposition associated with a lot of the work that lawyers actually do. More generally, we need to move more stuff from the art column into the science column. And that, that is not going to be neutral. I don't think it's neutral in terms of the labor market. And not everybody gets to go for the ride on this. But this is your opportunity. But what was going to remain thereafter, I, don't, I, I can't imagine it's neutral. That seems like a fantasy to think all these things happen and it's totally neutral. That seems unlikely. But I think what remains afterwards will be actually a much better industry that better serves because it's focused on the actual return on investment that people it provides, uh, provides a real return on investment. So I'm Dan Katz, Illinois Institute of Technology, um, Chief Strategy Officer at LexPredict, which is a legal analytics company. I'm also affiliated faculty, external affiliated faculty at Stanford Codex. This is my company, LexPredict. This is my blog, Computational Legal Studies. I'll see you over there in Computational Legal Studies. Hit me up on Twitter, at Computational on Twitter, at Computational on Twitter. This is my lab group, The Law Lab at Illinois Institute of Technology, right there in downtown Chicago. And this is my contact information. Thank you very much for your attention today. Okay. So I thought uh, maybe if people had any questions, we covered quite a lot. That was, uh, you know, a rat. We just kept on moving there through a, through a lot of information. Anybody have any questions about all of that?
It's just like everything you've learned in law school, right? Learned a lot about that? Well, um, I have just one basic question, and this is, um, if, you, if we say that we can put every case into O's and ones, you know, like, that it's like data, um, what, what we've been... We can do 0.5 also, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. No, but um, speaking in artificial intelligence language, you know, um, then there's the problem that indeed um, most cases are different and also clients may have um, issues that are different um, to what we've typed in before. So um, then they would have a question and then you need experts to deal with this unpredicted question. And uh, this could also inhibit um, yeah, these uh, fixed, uh, term, fixed term contracts, uh, fixed price contracts where you have um, a certain sum and you say, well, this is what it costs, but there may be some information that the client didn't uh, know and then you try to price this afterwards so you have to adjust the contract maybe because it's going to take longer. Construction, it's called a change order. Yes. But so is that your, but yeah. on your first point, I'll just, so we'll yeah. talk about change yeah. orders, but your first question was about, uh, yeah. if, if it's we really can't possible. predict all this stuff, yeah, exactly. things are unknown, there's some late inherent uncertainty. I would say there is inherent uncertainty no matter what method you use. What I might just suggest is that if you track performance of the experts on the ability to forecast, often they, people set up this, this examination where the sort of, some mixture of artificial intelligence or crowdsourcing has to beat perfection. Meanwhile, they haven't kept score on the performance of the current process. When we typically have kept score in virtually any field, it's not a very pretty picture. That's what the Kahneman article was about. You go to your doctor, and the doctor says you have cancer. How much confidence should you have in that? You'd probably get a second opinion. Get a second opinion. <laughs> that sounds like what? Like, a, like you're heading towards a crowd, right? Because <laughs> you inherently understand that that might be a faulty view. So I, I, I just, I always flag this for people because when it's not our stuff, we're the first people to make that move, which is like, what's crowdsourcing? I don't know. Does this guy know anything? What does he know? Maybe he doesn't know anything. I want a third, a second, third, fourth, seventh opinion. But that's because you inherently believe that there's some late uncertainty. Then we come to our field and we think, here's the human expert, and they're infallible. And I have to bring some method that is somehow better than infallibility in order for it to count. But I think if you look into a lot of these processes, a lot of these performance, like we, I gave you an example where the experts did a bad job relative to the algorithm, but people, people still can't see how that could be possible everywhere. This is like your moment in the matrix where you see the world for what it really is. And it's like the first day of the rest of your life because that's where all the opportunities are, is to exploit the fact that there is all this imperfection. So I want to just encourage you not to think of the current process as being something that can't be touched, and what if there's this and what if there's that. We'll start by crowdsourcing, which is our first move, like in medicine, if it's anything other than our field. But then you say, well, what's the scientific studies say about this? Which is to say we're trying to kind of get data of a sort, because people have done studies with data and tried to look at it. So I, I actually think we do this in every field but our own, and our first instinct is to do this everywhere but our own. So I just want to encourage all of you to see the opportunity here because we got a lot of deficiency, as I see it, across a lot of problems. Now, you might say, what is the return on all this? Can I make it 5% better? 3% better? 10% better? 20% better? One problem is we haven't really kept score, so we don't even know what the rate of performance is today. I don't know if making something 5% better is worth it. But in some areas, it would be worth it. Part of why I point you to the finance type examples is because their small differences are over large dollar amounts, and it really does make a pretty big difference. And if you could get 5% better over a portfolio of choices, you don't just have to use an algorithm and just, just never touch it again. And remember I said experts, crowds, and algorithms. You can blend them. When you're, we talked about this earlier. When your credit card is turned off, typically, not always, sometimes they will give it to an analyst to look at it and decide. Sometimes your card gets turned off and turned back on, and you don't even know it. It's because somebody said, no, 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 that looks okay. So they flag some event, and then they let a human look at it. And that human technology blend is better. 
There's no way at that with those problems to even do it otherwise. There's not enough people to watch all the credit cards being run. So anyway, that's just. If I hope that's partially responsive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, other questions from the group um, over here, I think. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for for your speech. It was uh, really interesting. It was a pleasure listening to it. Um, so, when I got it correct. Uh, your idea was to, or the solution would be to have this ensemble, the blend of the crowd, of the algorithm. Um, how how exactly do you would put together, how would you predict the right percentage of each element of the of the ensemble? That's, a, that's itself a what's called a learning problem. It's a machine learning problem. It's a statistics problem. What is the optimal weight of these three streams of intelligence? And that's an optimization problem in itself. Um, in trading, they say, what trading strategy would have worked up to today and would it have returned a greater performance than the existing process, whatever it is? So you f the first step you do is you simulate backwards. You sort of say, you do a little game. If I had been using this blend, how would I perform relative to my performance? This all presupposes you're keeping score. Okay, Remember, we don't really keep score. But if you did, then you'd have something to test against. I told you it took a long time to go from the way finance was to the way it is now. So I don't, I'm not saying this is right around the corner, but the places to do it is the high, the high return areas because there it would be worth it pretty much right away. But then you're, you actually simulate out what's called out of sample. You try to show in previously how it would have performed. You can also do is look at 80% of the data and try to predict 20% of the data. So those would be done first then you might deploy it going forward. Now, here's the issue. The world could change. The world could change. The past isn't always a good prediction of the future. But remember, that's true for a human, too. Like, everything, if I told you tomorrow everything you knew about a process was no longer valid, you would also be kind of guessing at that point as to what to do, right? You would fill the void in your mind with some logical, with some leap from where you are, current state, to that future state. So I want you to think that like this problem doesn't go away with or without an algorithm. You're just filling the space with your own view about what the change in the world means for something. You're using your mind to fill that jump. Oh, you think all, all, they change judges out. Um, the, this, play, this, this person does something I didn't expect. Now I'm in a, in, maybe I don't have, I've never experienced something like this before. You're, you face all those problems, but there are well-known ways to deal with this problem of some problems just have lots of inherent uncertainty to them. Like there's a big distinction in science between, say, tide prediction, which is highly, highly rigorous, almost pinpoint accuracy. It's got mechanics to it, but basically there's a book called a tide table, and you can just flip through, and they'll tell you exactly to the minute when the tides come in. Weather prediction, highly stochastic. Outside of 10 days, you can't beat an almanac in terms of performance. One last thing I'll say about it, open it up for others. This is agriculture production. This is an almanac. It was a huge deal in human history to have an almanac. What does the almanac do? It's a prediction to a farmer about when to plant crops. You get better yields if you plant on this day versus that day, okay? No one goes around with an almanac and says, I can tell you it's going to rain at 433 today. It's not that type of prediction. But it's better than the existing process. And that's what a lot of what we're doing in law is the weather business. It's hard to predict things, but, not, but we can predict to a level of precision. That, does that help you? It's a level of precision relative to the problem, relative to the existing processes. By the way, in agriculture, the next big data challenge in agriculture is to better collect data to build even better forecasts of exactly when, not just in this region you should do it, but exactly based on this year's rainfall and this year's soil composition and all these sort of inputs, exactly when those crops ought to be planted in the hopes of maybe feeding, getting 5 to 10% higher yields. Big deal in humanity if we could get 5% hi higher crop yields by just planting a little bit better time. A question back here and then here. Thank you. First of all, let me say I'm completely with you. Okay, I good. You can just hand the microphone over to him then. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, one should... This is usually when the bad part is coming. Yeah, Yeah, and this starts <laughs> now. Since, again, the financial revolution is coming straight out of Chicago, let's 
just forward 25 years when we're full-blown legal finance tech uh -huh. and somebody digs out Frank Knight and tells you putting a risk on everything is a nice idea mm -hmm. but it's just not possible because some things are inherently uncertain and it is a, f um, a false belief that you can put risks numbers and calculate with mm -hmm. those risk numbers on things what you do is you build highly fragile systems because mm -hmm. you might be wrong sometime and then some other time you're so much you're so off that you basically break the financial market or do anything else. The legal system, of course, is a mess when it comes to efficiency, but it's so robust. It's, I mean, not, th I, I don't claim I understood what you really mean, but I think it is an example of being anti-fragile. Don't we risk, if we put risk numbers and probability on everything, don't we risk this Wait, stability? you're putting risks on the fact that we don't have risks. No, I'll just flag well, that. My, That's my, okay. My, my point is, uh, uh, does it make sense to make this, or is it a good idea to make the legal system less stable? Because if we just do random decisions, it's one thing. It's more or less stable. We don't, we don't optimize in the wrong direction. We might, well, it's the whole concept of uncertainty. We just cannot know. What is it we can't know? If you can't know things, I'd like to ask you what you're telling your clients every day. If you have no value to bring, no ability to forecast, what are you telling them? I mean, I'm just asking, what, what would you say to them? I mean, you have to say something. They ask you a question. Do you say, the world is inherently uncertain, ergo I can't tell you anything. You make some forecast on some basis, right? Now you could note to them, I think, you would say, well gee, this is, this is a fairly uncertain by the way, having knowledge about uncertainty is itself a form of knowledge, right? I mean, if you can say something is uncertain when people think it's certain, that's value in and of itself. But do you see why I'm just asking you this right now? I don't think you actually believe what you just said. Well, actually, um, I, I do believe that um, there are things that are actually, un that are actually uncertain. Yes. Um, I How uncertain? In, I have the great luxury of not having to advise clients. Oh, well, that, that is, a, which is, that is, a, that is a quite a luxury. I very <laughs> nice indeed. Um, but I mean, the weather would be an example. The weather in more than 10 days is uncertain. And if there it's, are at least people... It, you can do an almanac. An well, almanac is a form of prediction. It's just a lower grade of prediction. It isn't precision. It has lower precision. But I can tell you... So you would argue that there are no uncertain events. There are only no, risky events. No, this is not. This is not Pascal, or not. This is not uh, 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 Laplace's demon. Okay, this is not that. I'm not making some determinism argument. I'm only saying is we have to have some way to organize ourselves. So we did an almanac. We never acted like it was 4:33. It's going to rain in 25 days from now. We can't do that. But what you're doing with the Almanac is just putting a confidence interval on the r on the probability on the risk yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that isn't that the whole argument that everything is risk, nothing is really uncertain because if we if we really take the chaos argument, mm -hmm. then we just cannot know. Um, the the paths that development takes are so inherently unpredictable. If we don't know the exact initial configuration. To the even if we do thousands decimal, even then we cannot really say. But again, if you say an almanac is a is a prediction that beats chance or that beats randomness, you say that there is it's it's only risk, it's only probability. We can somehow figure it out. Just make the model better. We can create ra a range, but I mean, the more pa even with large scale computing power, we still can't really crack the almanac because it's got inherent. We can't crack weather fully because it's inherently stochastic. So I think a lot of what lawyers are doing is like that. It's a lot like weather. We can provide a grade of prediction. I think they do worse than the almanac right now. Let me just put my cards up there. So getting to the almanac, we wouldn't be in this problem of Laplace's demon, like pure determinism or something like that, but we would offer a higher quality prediction. We would reduce the amount of total risk, but you don't take it to zero. All you're doing is looking at the world and trying to provide a forecast about what it might look like. How much precision can we bring to bear? What's the current method do? And how does it compare to some alternative? That's kind of all I'm suggesting here. Now, the, the, the second question, the second part I really liked quite a bit is this anti-fragile idea. So one of the challenges would be, like we saw in the financial crisis, people come to believe more in these models than they ought to. Now that is a strong lesson that we had from the financial crisis. You know, you had these highly compensated bankers running all this stuff on Excel that was way, that the quality of the model was way above that. 
in terms of like what you needed to really do it well, but the quality of the people running it was not sufficient for the quality of the of the model in question. I mean, that's one picture of the finance. There, there were lots of stories of the financial crisis, but so I think that that's actually that's a pretty interesting set of ideas. I don't think it really justifies like why we spend more time on these tasks, these like um, writing a contract or why we do a clause different than we're doing. But there is something to be said. I think this idea that we might be creating small summed up pockets of risk that we don't realize as risk is a kind of interesting and needs to be thought about idea. So I don't want to be misunderstood. I think that is one of the implications here is that we might create a, a problem with, with robustness or fragility in certain pockets. Uh, sir, you had a you had a question. Well, it's a short question. I really like your idea of mixing um, data with expert opinions mm -hmm. and crowdsourcing. And regarding the crowdsourcing, uh, I'd like to know which kind of crowd you want to take because yes. you mentioned economic regulation and you in a, in a in highly uh, specified markets where the economic regulation is really complex there are only few people who just know about how the economic regulation works mm -hmm. so the data and uh, the, the expert knowledge and the crowd it's basically the same person so so where do you want to take the the crowd from because with Neil Gorsuch, of course, there's like 200 million American people who yeah. know about the issue. But how do you imagine? I, I, I don't think I'd say that. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. I would, re I would reject the premise. In, in an ideal thing. world, uh, uh, yeah. Where do you take that crowd from? How do you select the crowd? Who are mm -hmm. these people you want to crowdsource to gain your knowledge? Yeah. No, I think so. One of the interesting questions or implications is: is having more knowledge worse? Right especially if you think that knowledge is better than it is. Sometimes, I mean, the interesting thing about our guy who does the best on Supreme Court prediction is he doesn't have the kind of pedigree, the kind of background that you would expect to do well at the task, but in some ways knowing less is better because he doesn't overfit. I mean, that's part, I take that to be part of your question. One of the interesting questions is would we do better on some of these tasks with a mix of lay people and experts? So. The crowds idea could be crowds of experts or crowds of non-traditional experts. I mean, I'd like to be able to benchmark them in some way because I wouldn't have just put a random person in here. I mean, that you could get a quite a worse thing than if you used a, a person with expertise. I'll point out one interesting idea that people have talked about in the regulatory context with people with specialized knowledge is this idea of having private, private markets for regulation, but the cost of being the market runner is that you bore the liability of the mistakes. So now you have an economic incentive to not let the bad stuff happen because you're now responsible. Um, I think some of what Jillian Hadfield talks in her new book, Rules for a Flat World, which I'd encourage you to take a look at, uh, she talks a little bit about this idea. It's an interesting idea, but the idea is then they could use any of these methods, but then the core is that you then link the financial responsibility to them. So in other words, if you're going to set the, what we have now sometimes is we have a regulator setting rules who doesn't really suffer the consequences of their mistakes. They do good or they do bad. If they get manipulated by external forces or whatever, but now the person doing the regulation actually owns the responsibility. It's kind of like making them the insurer of that task. It's like an insurance or reinsurance task. It's a, it's an interesting idea. We've experimented it with it in a few pockets around in around the world, but it's not a major idea yet. But I think it's something that at least should be thought about of how how it might be able to be constructed. At least that's my view. Uh, subject to revision if I see the way it actually lays out. I might, I might reject it at that point. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, let's, uh, well, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Let's uh, stick a little bit to the crowd because everybody okay. talks about uh, algorithms and that they're magic and that yes. they can do everything, but not so many models include the crowd, and I think that's very unique in your model. Um, but all the models that you have, or the examples that you brought, uh, they seem to be by crowds that are the same crowds that uh, fill Wikipedia and they contribute uh, free of charge. Uh, is that uh, always the case in oh, your I'm model? Oh, I should have mentioned, they are playing for prizes. Those crowd members, I, I, I apologize, I should have mentioned, it's kind of an important fact. They have an economic incentive to try to do well. Now, they, it's free to play, and then we were partnering with Thomson Reuters. They get like top prizes, 10,000 US dollars, and there's a bunch of prizes below that. So what's important, I just would note, is that they have some economic incentive. But one of the interesting things is, and this is like a whole new thing, is this idea that um, a number of different uh, uh, groups are trying in the kind of 
blockchain Bitcoin economy is this idea of expertise networks where people could sell their expertise on a crowd-based or otherwise. Uh, um, in other words, their participation in that market, if they did well, they could get not just an, a reward, but they actually could get paid for their predictions, which starts to sound a lot like being a lawyer. Except for in this case, at least the person, we don't, we don't do that now, but at least this person would have shown themselves to be good at the task at hand. Can't say that for a lot of lawyers. They haven't actually. I, sometimes I'll hear I have people say to me on these events, you know, oh, well, you know, I would have done way better than this. And I always say, well, you can always enter next year. Good luck beating, good luck beating them. You know, oh, well, I'm very busy right now. I'm not, this wouldn't be the best time. So, you know, I sort of put that out there to people uh, 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 because I think a lot of people are scared to actually see what it might look like. You know, I think. Now, I want to mention something. Being able to forecast isn't always, isn't necessarily the only task people do. You could reorganize your organization, find the people who are good at forecasting. They may be bad at other parts of the task, but like direct the resources towards people who are good at this, people who are good at this, people who are good at this, which is a more meritorious system as I would see it than just, hey, it's your turn or, hey, you, you, uh, uh, um, you've been here a long time or whatever the reasons are. You know, people think you're good at this. I, I, I just think we, if we kept score better, we'd actually be able to figure out who's really been successful at these things and who hasn't. So that's one of the, one of the challenges. I, it's, you know, I, I, I um, lecture kind of all over the world, and I'll just say this. Every jurisdiction has differences, but lawyers are lawyers. Okay? It's like the same animal if you were to go to China or South America or Germany, or the United States, or anywhere in between, lawyers are lawyers. Same animal. There's differences. You would recognize that animal anywhere. So I don't think, I think the differences are much smaller than the similarities. Like, the differences across lawyers is like this big, and the similarity across lawyers is like super coupled. So it's not like they're all spread out and it's so different. They kind of have the same mindset, the same industrial organization, more or less, is a, lo a lot of similarity. So I think that, that's good news for us for our, our ability to learn from others, mistakes and failures. With, obviously, with some differences that have to be acknowledged, but I think there's a lot more similarities than differences. I would definitely say that. Other, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, just a quick question. You, know, you were talking about uh, benchmarking the performance of lawyers. I was just wondering, how would you, how would you do it? How would benchmarking the performance of lawyers look like? Okay. Um, every time you take an action, you express every major action, you express the reasons for the action you took. So, for example, and some, some numeric about it. For example, uh, I think this matter is worth 1 million euros. With, and I think the probability of it, it, it's between these two numbers, and here's the probabilities associated with that occurring, okay? I think this clause version versus that clause version, it has an economic difference of this. Or if this contingency were to happen, it would cost us this much and with this, this likelihood of happening. Keep score of all that over time. So a lot of those things are in people's minds because they're sitting there like arguing with somebody about, well, no, we have to have it this way for this reason, because what if this happens and I've got to protect my client? So in their minds, they're cal like if it was super minor, you would just say, well, no, we'll, we'll not make a big deal, but we'll go for this other thing. So in your head, you've done some implicit calculation, but I'd like to see that be more explicit. Mark it down and keep track. So what's the, how often does that actually occur? How much agreement is there? One of the little things we do with that platform is we'll sit with a group and I'll give them an example. And I'll plot in real time the distribution of, uh, of views in just a room of people. It's, it's very telling. Like, you'd think, I get everybody here together, and we'd all kind of be about right here. That's one vision. Sometimes it is. Maybe there's a lot. Sometimes it's like this. There's huge ranges of disagreement about what something stands for. Now, it's interesting. If I was just to pull one of you, where, wh what part of that distribution would I be pulling? But you only see that. It's like that. If I could do that with you right now, and you saw the distribution, you're like, "Wow, there's a lot of disagreement in this room about a thing that isn't. It doesn't have to be the hardest thing going, 
or the easiest thing, but something in kind of middle range of complexity and how much disagreement there is even among a group of people that are in the same profession or at the same school, right? That much variation. That's exactly what Kahneman's talking about. Doctors have all this variation. Software developers have all this variation. I think it's sometimes that variation's good, but I would assert in this context it's not good, especially if you don't know the variance. I pull from you an answer. I cannot plot the distribution that of, of possibilities from what you told me, because you just tell me a number or a value, a probability, so forth and so on. So that's what I want you to see. Getting, knowing just the distribution is a lot more knowledge than we often have when we're driving these decisions. Like, does it look like this? Does it look like this? Is it like skewed the one way? Again, we don't really, that's what we're trying to get to in this field. That would be a much better situation, a much better way to manage risk. So maybe one more question, if there's any others, or we can, uh, um, oh, oh, yes, sir. We'll, we'll, we'll have you take the microphone. Um, as a lawyer, I have the feeling that uh, I, I, everything resonates with what you say. It's very great. But uh, okay, just for, my, for my daily practice, just one question, and there's a lot of things you can talk about. What, um, do you think everything is, can be put in numbers, or is there, isn't there a lot of times, then, and I'm not sure about the other lawyers in the room, uh, where we help our clients kind of getting comfortable with things that may, might actually be against the numbers? But it's just people, you know. Give people me an example. I mean, if you're um, if you're being a therapist or something, I suppose that's uh, yeah. That's, okay, that's what happens. That's fine. And they're, they're part but of you're going to lead to some decision, I assume. That's yeah. what, right? You're helping guide them with a decision, even in the therapy session. Uh, in the therapy session, I'm not sure, but um, so so. <laughs> If you're negotiating a contract and you have pressure from your uh, department head, mm -hmm. th they want this clause in there just because it's the policy. Then we help them kind of make it make it happen, or we uh, we transfer that. I well, mean, this is part I'm asking: Why is yeah. that the policy? How much economic value is created by the policy? Is that policy justified in this particular area given the economic returns? Like you have to have, you're going to say this is just the rule. I would assert that you're not being a great lawyer there if you could just go in these, because you might say, gee, I think that that's actually causing, if you could put a number on it, because in your mind, something tripped and said, I don't think we should do this. Why did you do that? Because you did some quantification in your mind that allowed you to even make a statement like that. You know what I'm saying? In your mind, that's why it triggered. Yeah, Otherwise, you wouldn't even care right. about it. I mean, you're right in that, but I think maybe it's, it's, it's a very, very complex task to quantitate everything, and maybe it's not worth it. Maybe it's not worth it. Maybe it's not worth it. I mean, you'd, ha I mean, uh, uh, you'd have, to de you have to decide. If you're just doing very, a very modest sort of contract that doesn't make a lot of difference in the scheme of things, then don't spend very much time on it then. Why not just accept the other side's paper and be done with it? I mean, this, you can this goes a lot of different directions. If it's super minuscule, then just accept their paper and be done. You can do no work then. Right? I mean, the point is you're putting time on it because you think there's some new economic return. Otherwise, you're spending your time on something that you're telling. You see what I'm saying? If there's either value in it or there isn't. If there isn't value in it, don't do any work. Just say, we accept your paper. Done. End of transaction. If you think there's value in it, then certainly you're not going to spend 100 hours on it. You're going to spend some calibration relative to the return. So in your mind, you're already doing a calculation. This is the, this is the challenge of the field. I, I just want to encourage you to, to try to break the artisanal mindset, which is, I am painting the Sistine Chapel here. I'm going to paint this thing so perfectly. I'm going to write this in just the perfect language. There, but maybe there's no val economic return to it. Maybe just stop and do, do less law or more law where there's a return on your time. Like, just an example. A lot of companies have gotten out of doing NDAs. They just say, We're just, we don't even care. We're just going to write one NDA, and that's the end. We're here. Or we'll just accept general terms on an NDA. And the reason they did this is there's no value in them. Just do a general one and be done with it. Cisco went to this. We're just going to automate all the NDAs. It's a waste of time. There's no economic value in it. They made a decision as a company. I don't think they failed to exist over it. I don't think it cost them any money. They, they generate an NDA, but they're not going to get into, like, I'm going to do some micro-differencing with you on the No, just here it is. Or if we look at, we're just accepting your paper if it has these provisions and that's it. And it's like a 10 second deal. So I just want to encourage you, like, there's a bunch of stuff like that that's getting, in my view, over lawyered because there's no, you know, foundational economic understanding of, like, wh why are we doing this? Is it valuable? Does it have a return? Because I'd like to free up his time 
to do the things that are at the higher end of the spectrum of his no cognitive. We suddenly say practicing at the top of your license, doing the things that, you, that are really worth your effort. And I know they're out there. There's got to be stuff where you're like, why am I doing this all the time? This isn't very useful. I should be spending more time on this, and maybe there's a policy that's causing you to do that. I don't know. Does that, does that resonate at all? No, you can do it. They do the NDAs. They just don't spend any time working on them. They just automated the whole thing. Like, this is the NDA. Oh, you want this version? Fine, take it. That's fine. Because the, the minor differences in clauses are not material. That's the idea. Just so, like, that's just one example. But there's other contracts that look a lot like that, where there isn't a lot going on but past the boilerplate, right? I mean, you have to have certain parts in there. But uh, anyway. Well, I think we've uh, I think we've we've uh, one final completed. question maybe from from my side. Oh yes, sir. Um, yes, uh, that is your you. prerogative, I believe, isn't Thank it? You. Yes. Um, now I think we have to be honest that when when you um, when you do your show and you show these results mm -hmm. and they come quickly up and they look nice and the ideas are good, okay. but what's behind there is like really tough. That's I mean, true. Doing, uh, let alone taking your quantitative methods class is some is a big investment for students because they will allocate a lot of time going through that and do it. Right. I, I think that's right, but um, you talked about ROI before that, yes. and you said then the system gets better and the future is better and we reduce social fractions, but um, I want to put it in a probably more financial term. Okay. If I invest all that time and learn statistics and mm -hmm. computer sciences and I look at the markets and I get all that, what's in that for me? Well, I, you have to understand, if you believe any of this future that I've painted to you, then people are going to, organizations are going to need people with different skills than what they have today. They don't have the people that know the stuff they need to know to fill. If you, I could be even half wrong there, half wrong. There's still a pretty big skills deficit between what organizations have along these dimensions and what they're going to need. So I, I think it would be balancing your portfolio uh, a little bit to try to put a couple of investments in, this, in these stocks, let's call it. You're already going to have a lot of stocks invested in the other. Maybe just buy a little bit of a hedge over here. So I wouldn't necessarily commit all of your chip, all of your investments to this, but in a balanced portfolio, you might consider having a few investments of this nature. And I think that that's a reasonable presentation of it. Uh, but I think you're getting quite a bit of law already. I think a little bit of this stuff would be, help, you know, like you're doing a lot of that, but a little bit of this could really be a nice blended portfolio just to bring it home to the, ta to the topic at hand. So thank you for setting me up for that question. But uh, um, so all I'm saying is, you know, balance your portfolio that, uh, uh, and consider some of these activities as part of your blended D portfolio. Dan, thank you. That thank was you a very great much. talk. It was a great night. I won't keep anyone from drinks. It's over there. Drink Please. it all. It's been paid for. Enjoy yourselves okay. and let's phase out. Thank you very much.